like that. You know, Lori, I appreciate what you shared. Perspective. Perspective is very interesting, and it really changes the way we see some things sometimes. And, and my daughter always tells me that same thing, too, is you got to trust the process, Dad. you got to trust the process. And I'm thinking that's so true. And over the last week, I've been thinking about this final week of Advent. It begins today. It's the final week. The countdown is on. The, the march to Christmas is here. And next Sunday, we're not gathering together here Hopefully you'll we'll be gathering together in your own homes and doing the Christmas thing you do at your house. But we're going to be back here, like I said, January 1st, 2023. And it's so hard to believe that 2022 has flown by as quickly as it has. And so I've been thinking about this last week, and I've been thinking about Advent altogether, and what we've looked at already. You know, the first Sunday of Advent, we looked at hope. And the hope that the Israelites received back in the time of Isaiah and how the nation of God was at this pivotal point where this word came at such a tremendous time that brought them hope. This word that they were, they were awaiting a baby born of a virgin, this, this savior, this Messiah. And that was week one. And now with Advent, I just want to say with Advent, you know, there's those four basic themes, hope, peace, love, and joy. And although they're the same every year, each theme of it, you know, carries a different perspective or a different angle which we can look at every year or every angle you want to find, you can dig deep and just go hard at it. And depending on the place where you're at, the message might differ or the theme style may change. Maybe someone's going to spend the whole Advent in the Old Testament or somebody else will spend the whole Advent in the New Testament or they'll talk about the coming king or they'll talk about the hope of Christ. All over the place, we're going to be these... This different style of messages, but the theme of Advent is all the same. And uh, even if you move it around, the theme stays the same. But we started with hope. So I just want to get that out of the way. We started with hope, and then we moved into to week two, which was peace. And more accurately, it was this, this disruptive peace that Jesus brings. Not only when he came as a fulfillment of that promised hope of that baby, but, but the disruptive peace that he brings to each and every one of us. And it is a disrupt, disruptive, not destructive, disruptive piece of life because it just, it changes how we view things. It changes how we live our life. And it just, it just throws a, a wrench into these things society calls normal. So it's this disruptive piece he brings. And last week, which was week three, it was supposed to be love, but our community gathered together and, and we had the opportunity to listen to Phil Calloway. And he came and he shared, and he, I heard he was fantastic. I had to miss it. And, uh, and he, was, he brought the theme. I think it was hope he brought. And so that's okay. We forgive him. We love him. We were going to do love here. But I thought, what a better way to, uh, to show love than to have the community of churches join together and worship and fellowship to laugh and just, and just do a service together together. Put doctrine aside, put theology aside, and just come together and, and just, just enjoy a Sunday. I think that's a, a very good example of, of what that advent of love would be very much for us. As well all that taken place in the last three weeks, we have come to the fourth and final week of Advent. And this is the week that we look at joy. And joy is just one of those words that, uh, that can carry with a lot of different understandings especially as we look at Advent, or, or even more so in a church setting, because joy, kind of like love, we, we attach an emotion to it. We get this feeling going, and it doesn't always seem to work for us. Because we say things like, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And we, we just say it sometimes with thought, without meaning, and it just, it just sometimes just rolls off the tongue like that. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Or we can sing about it. But is it something we believe? Is it something we even understand? Because that's an interesting question to think about, and I've been thinking about that this week. Because one of the very essences of being a follower of Jesus is supposed to be this, this joy that we carry. But do we? Or is that joy even evident in our life? You know, when we look at the themes of Advent, apart from hope, Advent focuses on the, the very essence of a spirit-filled believer. Advent draws us to the understanding of a few of these fruits of the Spirit. Peace, love, and joy. And yet in life, throughout the year, those tend to be the very things that we all seem to, seem to battle with the most. 
Galatians 5.22 says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. There's those first three right off the bat. There they are. Then there's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And yet... Those are the very things that we tend to struggle with the most when it comes to things like depression or anxiety or self-worth or a list of so many other things that we've come to live with in our daily lives. And yes, I've got to say it as a spirit-filled man or woman of God, as a teen, as a child, as Christians, we can and we do suffer from those things as well. But yet, this fruit of peace, love, and joy is supposed to be evident in our lives. And even more so at this time of year as we focus on it during Advent. So I've been thinking about all of that. And you know, I I googled the fruits of the Spirit just like any pastor does these days. I googled it and Google gave me a page and a list of everything. And at the top of the Google search it had a definition that read like this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We read that in Galatians 5 but it went on to say something else. It said, those who are in Christ, oh, I wanted to say, I'm not preaching from Google, just so you know that. So if there's anybody out there getting ready to to attack me, I'm just reading what said. So those who are in Christ are distinguished from unbelievers in that they've been gifted with the Holy Spirit, enabling them to bear this fruit. We are to show evidence of love, peace, and joy, and all other fruits as well. And this is supposed to set us apart from unbelievers. Now, we do believe that, and, and we're not going to argue that or discuss that anymore, but, but for someone who's going through a hard time, which is a lot of, for a lot of people, they do go through a hard time at Christmas. Maybe this is the first Christmas you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's the first Christmas you're celebrating alone because of, of a divorce, or the kids have moved away, or there's something else, and the list goes on. The list goes on. A lot of people struggle with the holiday season, with Christmas and the new year. And not to mention, there's some people there who who battle with mental health. And so for them to, to to know that, to read that definition like we did, that's hard. Sometimes it's really hard for people to be able to accept any of that. Because for most, you know, the thing they struggle with is, is peace. That they're they're lacking that peace in their life. Or they're or they're lacking that love or that joy. Or even that self-control, the faithfulness, the kindness, anything else that's in those lists. And we, and we feel like we're missing that. That's why we're, that's maybe that's why we're depressed. Maybe that's why we're upset. And so what do we do now is we find ourselves, we're already feeling bad because we're in this state and we're supposed to be this way. And we start, start, start questioning, well, where's my faith in this? Where's all that fruit I'm supposed to have. It's Christmas. I should be even more evident in my life now more than ever. You know, shouldn't Christ be in me? I've heard this from people. I've had conversations with people about this. You know, should this not be evident all the time? And this should distinguish themselves from those who do not know Jesus. And the Spirit should be enabling them to bear these fruits. And this is just evidence of the sanctification that is in work in their hearts That last little bit was the rest of the definition that I googled. But like I was saying, for some believers, even at this time of year, peace, love, and joy are not that close to their core. Even though we may say it, and even though we may act like it or pretend everything is good, Christmas, believe it or not, is one of the most stressful times of the year. I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you that. We know that. And those words we focus on are very big words. They're very big words. And sometimes when we look at that definition, we may not even feel like we have Christ in us or, or, or that we carry that hope of Christ that we speak about, let alone that peace or that joy. Because, you know, we don't feel that those gifts are evident as they should be in us or in our lives. And by thinking that way, we start feeling this, this, this downward spiral of negativity. And all of a sudden, Christmas becomes a season of debts or, or regrets, guilt, shame, and so much more instead of what it's intended to be. And I know that's not everybody out there. I I know not everyone thinks like that or feels like that. But you would be surprised to hear how many people struggle with all of that, especially more and more at this time of year. 
And to add to all of that mix as well, what about the way we've lived for the last couple of years? People still have mixed emotions and feelings about everything. People are still worried. You know, some people have been slow to come back to the body of Christ even. Because something that we all know and fear even more now, it's not COVID, it's not the flu, but social anxiety has become this new norm. And life is just different. And just the thought of being in places brings us this anxiety. Not peace, not joy. And boy, is there another Christmas party I've got to go to? I don't want to. But stress, anxiety, worry, fear even, that seems to be more the themes of some of the advent of the world we live in these days. I heard someone say this to me the other day. It is so relaxing to be able to cough in public once again without the fear of people running from you, judging you, or coming after you. And you know, that's a reality we've lived in for the last little while. And I'm really thankful for that too because I've been coughing all week. And you know, you're going to be like, well, that's still not me, Pastor. That's still not me, Lee. This, none of this relates to me. I thought this was supposed to be a, a Christmas message. Well, guess what? There are those that are part of the body of Christ that struggle with this all the time. They struggle with so much of this stuff. And as we know, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it says, if one part of the body suffers, then all the parts of the body suffers. And so how can we have that, that peace, hope, love, and joy in our own life when the body of Christ suffers? So guess what? It is part of you. But with all of that being said, for this week of joy, I don't want to focus on that negativity of stuff, as I already have. I want us to be able to put all that stress aside. I don't want to focus on anything else. I I don't want to focus on how we should act or how we should respond or what we should be doing. Instead, I want to just focus on the very basics of what that joy we celebrate is. I want to tear all that other stuff away and just look at the basics today and be reminded of where we get that joy. Years ago, I got a story for you. Years ago, with a youth group I ran. Conrad, I heard you laugh. You were there. We found that the youth were growing spiritual and they were doing good and they were doing amazing. We never expected they'd grow up to like do worship or anything like that. They're just awesome kids. Like, but along the journey, they had missed a few of the basic concepts, understandings of the faith. And it caused some theological hiccups, you could say, like some things that just weren't lining up. And so we had this youth retreat, and it was called Back to Basics. And the heart of this retreat was just that. Let's get back to the basics of our faith. And so we took a canoe trip to an island, and we we set up tents. We had a fire. You know, we never had any fancy devotions, but we took time to share the Word of God every day and learn from it. There was no fancy music either, just a guitar and a few songs. You know, we hung out. We played in the lake. We played on the lake. We we fished. We relaxed. And we just took a weekend away where we'd camp, have fun. And all we did was talk about the basic elements of our faith. It was a fantastic weekend. And although there was nothing new about it, everything about it was new. And so that's how I want to end this, this year. And that's how I want to end this, this season of Advent. Talking about the very basic start of what we all hope in and believe. And even though it is the most common and basic church thing you're going to hear for the next week or so, or around Christmas time every year, it is anything but common and basic. And it all begins in Luke chapter 2. At the time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary to whom he was engaged and who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. 
I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel's, angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. This was the birth of Jesus. This is the Christmas story. This is what Christmas is is about. This is a story we have seen acted out in plays year after year by bathrobe wearing toddlers, youth, and adults alike. A story we've watched year after year in movies or on TV as Charlie Brown asked that question of what is the meaning of Christmas? A story we have recited around churches or in our homes forever. It's in the greeting cards. It's in our decorations. It is a story that is so steeped in tradition that we can lose sight of the truth and the importance of hearing it over and over and over again. And I appreciated what you shared, Jardeth. As we sang those carols and we heard those words, do we know what we're singing? Do we know what we're reading? Because this story, we know it so well. You know, we know it so well that we skip over it when we start reading. Because, you know, we've heard it before. But when we do that, you know, sometimes we actually miss hearing what is said to us every year. After all, like I said, it's a story we have spent our lives listening to. And every year, we hear preachers and pastors try and get creative. We, we hear them try to make it carry more weight than it ever has before, or to be more significant this year than it was last year, or, or more meaning in your life than it ever has been before. Every year, we try to make this story that is so well known. We try to, we try to bring it to life in a new way, and I'm guilty of that, just as everyone else is. Year after year, I talk to pastors, and I ask them the questions, like, how do you take the Christmas story, the Christmas message, the Advent season, how do you take Easter and bring it in a new light year after year? How do we bring it in a new way to make us think about it like we never have before? Do we look at this story from Mary's perspective? I did that in my first Christmas sermon. Do we look at it from the shepherd's perspective? I did that last year. How about from Joseph's perspective? perspective? That was year two. How about, how about the perspective of the innkeeper or, or Joseph's relatives? How about the perspective of the angels or, or the wise men? Or, or, or how about King Herod's perspective? You know, if I haven't done one of those, I know someone else who has or I've heard someone else share a message about that. I've even heard a message from the perspective of the donkey that carried Mary to Bethlehem. And that was actually pretty cool. You know, I think we've heard a message from every perspective that we can look at when we read this Christmas story. And we, we've looked at the significance from every angle as well, too, of, of who the angels told. Mary, Joseph, Zechariah, Elizabeth, the shepherds. We, we've heard the significance of the manger, of going back to the city of David. We've heard the significance of the strips of cloth, even. And we hear some new perspective or new significance every year. And I'm sure we all have our favorite one. But that may be part of the problem of why we lack that peace, joy, love, or even hope every year. Or why it's not as meaningful or heartfelt as it should be. Because we're looking at this story from so many other people's perspective instead of our own. So let me ask you this. What is your perspective of this story? What sticks out to you? And not a historical perspective from 2,000 years ago that we read, but your perspective 
of all of that and how it entails to you and your life this past year or this past how many years. As we wrap up 2022, is this story personal to you? What perspective does this story bring to your life? After all, it is one of the main fundamental points of our faith that we celebrate every year. A baby born of a virgin. The birth of the Messiah, our Lord. Or, or have we just allowed this story to become just that? A story, a tradition, something that we just have to say and have to listen to and have to do every year. Something that, that, that's void of thought or emotions. Something so basic and so traditional that we lose our own perspective in the story. That we lose our own understanding of what it means to me and the value that it carries. And with that, when we miss that perspective, when we, when we lose sight of that, we miss what the Lord is speaking to us individually today. Because you know what? It's just the same old story. Do we lose sight of the significance of the struggle of Joseph and Mary as they spent nine months prior to this? Not to mention the years ahead. Do we forget about them being real people? These were real individuals, not just some made-up people who walked out their faith. You know, they, they had questions, they had doubts, they had drama they faced with each other. Come on. There was serious stuff going on. And let alone the drama they faced with the religious people, the family, and all the gossip. Can you relate to that? Because I think sometimes we forget about them. And we forget about them as, as we think about our own suffering. As we think about our own struggles and things we're going through. And we wonder, well, where, where are, where's my faith in that? We forget about the shepherds who were lonely and outcast, yet the angels brought them the message first. Do we focus on life, the life they lived, and how, how they handled this news and this responsibility they felt that they had to share this news with everyone, even despite what society thought about them? Do we think of that as we struggle to find how we should live or respond to that very thing as well? Do, do, do we battle those thoughts of loneliness and rejection that they knew so well? Do we forget about the sacrifice of the wise men in the search of this baby Messiah? The years of waiting for this moment. The journey they took. The cost it cost them. Do we think of that as we look at our own journey in life? As we follow the Lord's calling? As we look for the signs he's leading us to? I think Lori said it good too. Do we stop and think? how God stepped out of eternity and came to us as a baby, as a helpless baby, to love us, to free us, to save us? Do we think of the living conditions that our Savior, the King of Kings, stepped out to and was born into? Or, or has this story of our dear Savior's birth become just that, a story steeped in tradition? Something that we read or listen to right after we watch How the Grinch Stole Christmas every year. Or is it something more to you today? Does it carry the truth and examples we can apply to our own lives and every situation's day in and day out? You betcha, it does. Does it carry enough weight or significance in itself to hear it again and again every year just as it is? You betcha, it does. Does this story of our Savior's birth bring you any hope? Does it bring you peace does it, does it help you find love? Does it, do you see joy in it? Does this story speak to you personally? If it doesn't, we're not reading the same story. We're not sharing the same perspective. And if that's the case, then let us agree to end this year with that understanding. And let us start the next year. Let's start 2023 with a new understanding of what this moment really means of what we actually celebrate and what we actually believe to be true. And let us put 2023 in perspective of our Savior's birth, of our Savior's death, and of our purpose. It's Christmas time, and we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. After all, he is the hope of Christmas, a baby born of a virgin, a Messiah who has come to free us and bring salvation and give us hope for eternity. 
He is the peace of Christmas, a peace that comes to those who follow him, and a peace that is brought to this earth in a baby which was born the Prince of Peace. And he brings a peace that surpasses all understanding. He is the love we've come to know, a love we've come to understand, a love which which was given to us, a love we celebrate, embrace, and enjoy because God so loved us. He gave us his son, and you are loved. Jesus loves you. And he is the joy that we are all to carry despite what we struggle with or even how we feel. Joy is there even when we're not sure if we can see it or feel it because it's not just an emotion. You know, these are spiritual truths and this story is in us. It is more than than a feeling. It's more than emotion. It's more than just just this tale we tell. It is part of who we are. It is part of our, our very core. As ones who follow Jesus, we base our faith on this as well as his death and resurrection. Despite what we may think or how we feel about ourselves, this is in us. This story is part of us. The very essence of the Christmas story speaks to our hearts. For unto us a child is born, a son is given to us, a savior is born who is Christ the Lord, and he changes our very lives. And it begins here at this manger. And so today we celebrate the very relevant and very personal joy because it is Christmas. And we celebrate Jesus despite what we're going through or how we're feeling. We celebrate Jesus despite what we're facing or what we're dealing with. Because Christmas is not about the gifts and all that other stuff. And Christmas is not about us. It's about him and all that he brings. And yeah, he brings us peace, love, joy, and hope, even if we don't really feel it. Because our Savior and our faith is bigger than any of these emotions we carry, and he'll get us through it. We just got to trust the process. I want to close with one scripture, because, you know, a lot of times at this time of year, people tell me how guilty they feel, you know, because of what they have or what they don't have or what they've done. Or they feel guilty because, you know, they don't have that joy or that hope or that peace showing in their life. And they struggle with stuff. And so I want to close with Romans 8.1, which tells us there's, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So you can put that guilt behind you. And that alone will bring all the hope, peace, love, and joy that any of us could ask for. Amen? Will you stand with me as we close in prayer? I will say grace, and I'm hoping the kitchen is ready. And if not, we're going to set up tables in here, and we're going to give them a couple minutes. And then when it's ready to eat, we can just dig in and eat because I'm going to say grace right now. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this joy that even though it may not be evident in our life, it is built into the core of what we believe. And we believe in you. Jesus, this season is about you. Christmas is all about you. Let us not lose sight of that. Let us walk in that hope, peace, love, and joy. And even if we don't feel it, it is there. Father, I thank you for this baby, for your baby born in a manger. Lord, I thank you for the food. Lord, I pray you bless it to our bodies, use and our bodies to your service. And Father God, that we celebrate Christmas And we celebrate you more and more. We ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Well, you're welcome to stick around and eat. And if you're sticking around and eat, let's grab some tables and put them out.